trying to behave. God's good to us. He's blessed us. He's chosen us, and he's favored us. And I'm looking forward to bringing you this message today, but I'm also looking forward to declaring he is a mighty awesome God. I tell you, thank you, Father, for your goodness. Amen. Well, listen, I see several guests out there this, uh, this morning. Let's let all of our guests know how thankful we are they're with us today. Thank you for being a part of this day. We'd like to do two things today. Uh, we want to invite you to uh, fill out that portion of the bulletin that says guest information right after service. We'd like to give you a copy of a book that I released. Just a, just a way to say thank you. I don't care if this is your fifth time. If you haven't got that book yet, we'd love to, to give you a copy of that today. And uh, that way you can kind of be kind of like a couple more sermons to go with you. And uh, you can process, process those at your own rate and on time. And then as well, if, if you... Somebody said, well, I don't know if I'm, an, if I'm a guest or not. If, you, if this is after your third time, you're just part of the family. That's just how it is. Somebody said, what if it's my first time and I like it? Then welcome to the family. Amen. Praise God. We're glad that you're here. Now listen, immediately after this service, uh, that we're going to ask you to take a few moments, go out into the ministry fair, and see how you can become a part. Some of you are saying, I'd like to get more involved. That's going to be where you want to go. We're going to ask you to go through there. And the beauty of it is they try their best to recruit you. And they bake brownies and cookies. And I feel the Lord. Come on now. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I was walking around going, I can't sign up for anything else. But anyways, uh, take time and go through there. But immediately after uh, that, uh, just, just, just quickly after that, we're going to be having a time with those of you that are, that are new to our family. Uh, that if you'd like to stay for lunch with me today, I'd love to have just a few moments, Christine and I, to spend some time with you at lunch and, and just show you uh, uh, how to get a little more connected and how to know what we believe. I mean, you know, it's, it's important to know what those around you believe. Amen? Right. And, uh, you know, I, I've been preaching places and, and uh, preach something that maybe that, that pastor didn't believe specifically that way or whatever, and... And I thought, well, you probably should have found out what I believe before you let me preach. We just believe the Bible. Well, it depends on which Bible you're reading sometimes. Come on now. Which slant they put on it. You need to look. Is that preaching? You need to look and know for yourself. And so today I want to try to do my best to give you uh, something that kind of caused our older crowd the first service will look at me a little cockeyed because uh, uh, I'm going to mess with some old school theology for just a moment. I'm going to bring you a message entitled, Burn the Plows. Burn the Plows. You know, I believe, I believe I better read the scripture because I feel like preaching. All right, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 19. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Sathat, plowing a field. There were twelve teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing them with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. And Elijah replied, Go on back, notice this, but think about what I have done you. I know I'm supposed to hurry through this scripture, but I'm going to tell you, my God has touched me in ways I can never forget. So Elisha returned to his ox and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. And then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Would you bow your heads with me to pray over the word? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your anointing that is in this house. And Elijah comes out and he walks past all 11 other oxen and he comes up and the Bible says that he throws the mantle upon Elisha. And when he throws the mantle upon Elisha, something changes. Something happens. Now, I know that I've grown up in church, and I've heard this sermon preached so many times about the significance of the mantle, the, the power of the mantle, the, 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 the anointing of the mantle. We've heard those sermons and how it changed his life when the mantle is thrown onto you. And quite frankly, we could probably go that way this morning, but I fear that we have over-spiritualized the moment. I fear that we have, God, just to do this, boom, bam, 
bang. But God says, hey, carry the coat. Now, did I get to say that? In some cultures, pastors would take advantage of this and say, carry my coat, and you can have what I have. First off, I don't know that I would wish this on you. The Bible says you're judged with a harsher judgment. I always put it this way. I was skinny with dark hair when I got here, and look what this job's done to me. Come on now, amen. <laughs> but it was as simple as this. Come on, carry this. Carry this. Carry what? An old coat, a ratty old shirt. I mean, this is literally a shirt that I, that I, I threw into a stack to give away, and it just happened to be around this morning. An umbrella that was laying on the shelf, a bag that I use, and a half drink glass of water or, or a bottle of water. Carry this. And Rich is thinking, what's so spiritual about this? Rich is like, I'm tired of carrying everybody else's coats. But it's that simple, folks. Give Rich a hand. Thank you. Would you set that on that black thing here for me? We're looking for God to just show up. And I want to tell you, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit that can radically deliver people. I've seen people be set free from, from, from disease. I've seen people healed and, and, and delivered. I've seen people set free from years of drug addiction in one moment in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've seen that. But when you are looking for that to fix a situation that you're in, you might need to stop looking for the big bang and you might need to start looking for serving God. And watch what he says. He says to him, can I go and tell my family bye? And he says, watch this now, don't forget what's happened to you. Because when you try to go back, watch this, when you try to go back to yesterday, you're going to be tempted to live there. Because it fits. It is already used to you. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you today? It works for your life. And the thing is this. Many times people come to the altars, receive a touch from God, and then they go back to their other world. And before long, the other world has overtaken in them what they had received from God. I'm preaching truth. Because they forget they're not the same. And he says to him... Be careful that you remember you are changed. And I didn't mean to throw this into the part of the sermon right now, but I feel this burning in my heart. You have been bought with a price. Come on now. You are not the same as you were. You might have been raised that way. And it might be the easy way when you get angry or when you get upset to go back to your old habits. But I have come to tell you today, you've got to make a decision. Are you going to be who you used to be? Or are you going to realize that God's calling you to follow Him? And as you follow Him, don't forget that He also equipped you to succeed because he's changed you with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You see, we've got to learn to recognize when God's doing something in us. We're all wanting this big bang. I, I literally, listen to me, I literally about fell out of my chair this morning when I realized we're having the ministry fair on a day that God gives me a sermon about getting involved in ministry. I didn't put them together, and I was like, oh, you're good, Holy Ghost. You're good. Amen. But you see, when things begin to stir inside of you, and you're saying, God, I want you to move, and God says, then follow me. Take this and carry what you can do. You see, I've seen people change more in months because they're serving, trying to get a lesson to tell some kid about Jesus in a classroom because they're engaging their faith. Are you hearing me? They're using what God has done in them. Somebody said, I want to grow in God. How can I do that? Get involved in the things of God. 
And when the devil comes calling, listen to me now, and the devil comes calling and he says, you've had a bad day. You ought to come back to the way you used to handle it. You ought to run. You ought to hide. You ought to come get drunk. You ought to get high. Say something to the enemy and say, oh, no, you don't understand. I may not be living a perfect life, but I'm not who I used to be. I will not forget that God has chosen me. See, we can spiritualize this mantle thing. We can spiritualize all that. We can spiritualize the fact that there are 12 tribes of Israel and he was the 12th, tri 12th set of oxen. But the truth is, it walked, watch this, Elijah walked past others to come to him. Whew. And somebody somewhere shared the truth of Jesus Christ with you. And you bought into the kingdom of heaven. And it could, there are others just wondering where God is, and God has chosen to reveal himself to you. Am I preaching truth? You have family members, you're just praying, God, let them see who you are. My goodness. Don't forget what God has done. And when God starts calling you to serve him, you need to realize something. That if if you live in indecision about it, you have already made your decision. And if you fail to act, that is already an action. It's failing. Let me, let me say that a little clearly. Failing to act is an action. It's failing. You have chosen not to move forward. Now, opportunity comes knocking at your door. Pastor Don, you, this is a little too spiritual for me. Let me just break it down for you. You get invited to serve God. Engage in the things of God. Do you think there is anything spiritual about parking cars in the parking lot of the church? Be careful. Don't you try to sound spiritual. Because you're out there and people are like, you're like, here we go, here we go. And you got me in here going, you got to fit more in, you got to fit more in. And, and you're, they're like, here, and, you're, and people drive up and go, no, there. And you're like, do you mind helping us? We, if you park there, but that leaves us four cars. And then before long, they're going, no, there. And I've trained them, just smile and wave, boys, smile and wave. Come on now, amen. Because that person needs a touch of the Holy Ghost, amen. Get them in the building, let God deal with them. But one of the first steps to leadership starts in a parking lot. One of the first steps to your miracle starts when you begin to worship when nobody around you is worshiping. One of the first steps of your miracles when you walk to the altar and begin to create the atmosphere in which you worship. There is service within you. Some of you are saying, but Pastor Don, you don't understand that I have failed. God called me, I stepped up, and you don't even know what I did yesterday. But let me remind you what I always tell you, that when you are focused on what you've done, you've lost sight of what he's done. And he says, don't forget what I have done to you. Step up and begin to engage in the things of God. Begin to pray for somebody else. Doesn't make it easy, particularly if they don't even feel like they need prayer right that moment. But you obey God. Let's back up for just a moment, though. Elisha is called. He's, he's invited to go carry somebody's bags. But how many times had Elisha been... And somewhere, you, you see, that's, we over-spiritualized the moment. But somewhere along the way, he had to deal with the fact he was going to have to go back more than likely and tell the girl that he was engaged to, it's off. That wasn't going to go good. And then he's going to have to tell mom and dad who co-signed for the plow, I'm leaving work. So somewhere between there and his family, watch what he does. He kills the oxen and he burns the plow. You see, he could have bought another set of oxen, but when he burned the plow, he absolutely destroyed the connection to his old life. As long as you, I'm just going to lay this out. As long as you still have the stash of whatever used to be your problem hidden in a closet, you'll never get free. As long, you know when you fall in love with that person and, and, and you know that they're probably the one. 
I look at my lovely wife. I'm just thankful she lets me stay around. <laughs> you know, there, there has to come a time. There has to come a time that you decide, is it time to get rid of the love notes from the other people? You players out there, it's time to delete their numbers out of your phone book. Because she's the one. And if she gets in my phone and still sees their numbers, I might lose the one. I'm preaching truth now. You see, it's practical. But it's also spiritual. The option to go back has to leave you. The option of if this doesn't work, am I making any sense today at all? If this doesn't work, then I've got to eliminate that from my life. I've got to come to the place, I believe in the things of God, I'm going to follow God. It doesn't matter what diagnosis I may receive, it doesn't matter what financial situation I find myself in, it's not going to sway the fact that I have burned the bridges to yesterday and I have no choice but to keep following God. Why? Because I know what he did in me. And if he's done that in me, then I will follow him all of my life because he gave me hope where there was no hope. Amen. But remember something. As long as you can go back, you can't go forward. In order to go back to tell his family bye, he had to turn his back on his future for a moment. And how many days has he begged for this? And he says, well, okay, look, there's no way I'm going to stay behind that plow. And I don't know who the God's speaking to like this today, but I feel what I'm saying to you today. It's time for you to say, I'm not staying behind that plow anymore. You may have pushed a hard row, if I can steal from a country phrase today. For many years. You may have pushed up a hot, a, a hot day on a hot hill, trying your best to keep it straight and manage to make things work out in your life, and you know that God did not call you for this struggle. But you know that all you got to do is let go of whatever you're holding on to, and you'll be delivered. As long as you know where you buried the plow, you can always go back to it. I love what he does. I love what he does, and, I, and I'm skipping... Just bukus of what I wanted to say to you today because, quite frankly, I think you're getting the point. The next time I continue on in a point, figure out what you're doing right now. It makes me preach faster. Come on now. Amen. <laughs> you see, when you know God is calling you out of your current funk, but you can't follow because you won't cut the strings to defeat, you won't cut the strings to sin, or you won't walk away from that bad relationship, be careful it could cost you what you've been called to. And you find yourself just sitting aside, storing those contacts, keeping your options open. Anything less than commitment to moving forward into your freedom is a declaration of surrender to your inability to trust God. You see, if you won't move forward for God, you don't really trust what God has done to you. But if you learn to trust him, you know, many of you ask me today, how's, how's Brother Louie? Brother Louie's had a hard night. His blood pressure's bad. A lot of excessive pain. They're going in for further tests today. But they said that the moment he could speak, the first thing he said was typical Louie. Something hilarious. And I thought to myself, you know you have joy when it bubbles over when they're pulling a ventilator out of your throat. You know you found peace. I'm trying to invite you today to find joy, to find peace when you start realizing there is no way to go back. You see, everybody has moments in their life. Come on, if you'd come. Everyone has moments in their life where they are tempted to give up. They're tempted to give up on their dreams, to give up on their marriage, or to give up on their kids. You're tempted to give up on God's house. You're tempted to give up on people that, that are committed to you. You're tempted not to engage in the things of God. But listen to me. We must move forward, and we can never forget 
what he has done to us. Let me read this to you. Watch this. In order to make a lasting change, Elisha had to do more than just the spiritual. He had to invest his future by burning the plow. And he had to inform his family. Do you have that one person in your life that irritates you so much about the things that they're always, you know, hey, you can do it. You can, you can lose weight or, or you can make a better living or you can do this or you can do that. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody's got that in-law that somebody you don't really, you, you just smile. A child, yeah. Somebody that's pushing you. Listen to what Elisha did. Elisha told that person, I'm not coming back. Could you imagine the day that Elijah was so hard to keep up with that Elisha wanted to go back? Can you imagine that for just a moment? I'm trying to give you a spiritual, spiritual thing here. It's very practical, but very spiritual. Listen to me. Could you imagine the days that Elisha wanted to go back and said, this isn't working for me? But then he got a mental picture of that person and them saying, see, I told you you would make it. Go tell him you're going to make it. Go tell him I'm not backing down on the things of God this time. Go tell him you better count it on me because when you find me in six months, six years, 60 years, I'll still be sober. I'll still be clean. I'll still be following the things of God. As a matter of fact, I will have grown by then. You watch and see if God doesn't do something else in me because of what he's already done in me. You go tell him. Burn the bridges. Invest your life. Invest it all in the things of God. And watch what God can do. Let me close with this today. I, this story may not minister to you, but it, it spoke to people in the last service, and it's had a hold of me. There's a reason. I posted on my Facebook this week a picture of, of a tomato and a cucumber, better known as Bob and Larry. And there's a little song that goes with them for those of you that are still clueless. It's Veggie Tales. You, you know what I'm talking about? Pastor Michael's crossing every word of it. And I almost called this sermon, Who Killed Bob and Larry? Do you know what happened to Bob and Larry? Are you ready for this? Do you know how they died? Some of you are going, I didn't know they were dead. Let me tell you how Bob and Larry died. They were eaten by a purple dinosaur. It's true. They were eaten by a purple dinosaur. And his name is Barney. You see, VeggieTales was started because of what God did in Phil Vischer's life. And God began to bless him because all he wanted to do was tell kids about the things of God. And that was his purpose, and that was what he was after. And so it began to grow. Bob and Larry changed the little formers and the form, and things got nice. And then they sold 50 million CDs and DVDs and made hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of dollars. It blew my mind how successful they really were. And it all changed with one day, with one decision. Phil said he read a book, and I won't call the name of that author. I actually have the book. And in this book, it said... Dream an audacious, hairy, big dream. One so great that that becomes your life focus. And so Phil Vischer, the founder of VeggieTales, dreamed that he one day could eclipse Walt Disney. He wanted to become Walt Disney. Do you see the problem already? He lost sight of wanting to show people Jesus and he wanted to become a man somewhere along the way he began to leverage trying to produce a Disney style film called Jonah he leveraged the, the company beyond its abilities he double leveraged the company pretty much he leveraged personal wealth he leveraged everything he could leverage finally the movie came out and did not even produce one-third of what they expected. 
And then they were sued. And then the creditors started coming due. And I love to hear Phil's story of this. And he says, I failed my people, but most of all, I failed my purpose. I lost sight of why I started the journey anyway. God speaking to us? Listen to the message that changed his life, that kept him alive. This is a sermon someone gave. I'm going to give you a quote. If God gives you a dream, and the dream comes to life, and God shows up in it, and then the dream dies, it may be that God wants to see what is more important to you, the dream or him. You see, I've come to challenge you today. And I feel the Spirit of God as I'm speaking to you today. You ask God to give you a family. And then you end up begging God to keep it together. You ask God to give you a business, and then you have to beg God about your business. You ask God to give you that car, and then, then you have to decide if you're going to honor God or go to work to pay for that car. Preaching truth now. Phil lost sight of his purpose. It's in the going back and the going ahead that the danger arises. Why do we follow, folks? Because of what he has done to us. That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He forgave us. He chose us. And when we lose sight of that simple fact, I don't care how much anointing we feel in this house. I, my goodness, I feel the Holy Spirit in what I'm about to say to you. We could become another ministry set up for failure if we lose sight of the purpose of winning the lost in this world. We could be set up, built up, but that that man builds up will fall. Ooh, let me just rephrase that. That that man builds up will blow up. But those that God raises up will last. And even if it all goes away, I'm trying to close here. I'm just about three minutes over my time. Give me this, this phrase or this little story. Two weeks ago when Dr. Walker stood in this pulpit, I was so honored. He and I had been talking, and here's a man that pastored 15,000 people. 15,000. Listen, America tuned in to listen to his every word. And this is what he said to me. Watch this. He said with joy in his heart and fire in his eyes, they let me teach to 50 the other day. They let me speak to a Wednesday night with about 150 the other day. And at first I thought, how sad. But I saw the fire in his eyes. It didn't matter who was listening. What mattered was what God had done in an old mud shack out west somewhere that he told us about. What mattered was what God had filled him with his power and called him with his purpose. And he was going to follow until his last breath. What matters, church? Not what you think matters. You better watch out because there's lots of big purple dinosaurs ready to swallow your dreams but there's a great big God when you trust in him that began a good work in you that is faithful to carry it through to its completion if you will but trust in the Lord stay with me today if you would God speaking to anybody today look at those hands all over this place there's no heads bowed God speaking to you you have a purpose. He has a passion. Woo, my goodness. You have a purpose, but God has a passion. His passion is you. His passion is the lost. 
His passion are those that he died for, and your purpose is to be connected to his passion. Bow your heads with me in this place today. I'm going to give a call that I didn't expect to give. I didn't give this in the last service. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Don, God has arrested my heart. God has grabbed hold of me, and I know he has done something to me. And maybe you've never made a commitment of faith unto Jesus Christ, or maybe you know you've not been serving Jesus with your life. Some of you have prayed a long time for this moment. This is the moment you've prayed for. And today, you want to connect your life and your life's purpose with the passion that he has for you, and you want to surrender your life 100% totally to Jesus Christ. If that's you, can I see your hand in this place? Because God's going to change lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands coming up all over this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can put those down. Some are making significant commitments today. Some are making a commitment to Christ right now. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Don, I've heard what it means to be saved. I've heard what it means to be born again. Maybe you even walked an aisle and somebody put their hand on your head and every, the whole church clapped. But you know you've not been about your father's purpose because you're still connected to too much of yesterday. This is your moment. This is your time. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand if you say, I'm ready to move past that and give my whole life to Christ. I see that hand. 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 Wow. You can put those down. God's changing lives in this place. God's radically changing lives. What the enemy thought he could consume, God's about to claim. Because he is greater. He that is within you is greater than he that is in the world. Won't you just join hands with somebody that you're comfortable with that's around you? You don't have to reach across. This is what we believe in this place. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead. A lot of times we miss that. That he's alive. Why is that important? We believe that he's alive because if he's alive, that means he can do what he said he's going to do. And by doing what he's able to, the fact that he's able to do what he said he's going to do means when you call on him, he's going to save your soul radically. It means those of you who are rededicating your life to Christ, that you're about to step into an amazing new place in Jesus. God's going to change your world right now for the glory of God. We confess with our mouth believe in our hearts. We're going to pray this prayer with you. Somebody prayed it with us, and we're going to pray it with you now. I want you to pray with me now. Jesus, right now, I commit everything to you. In Jesus' name, Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe by the sacrifice of Christ that I am forgiven. I declare Jesus came for me, he died for me, he arose for me, and in Jesus' name, God is my Father, heaven is my home, this matter is settled, amen and amen. I wish you'd come on and give the Lord some praise today. Hallelujah! There's rejoicing around the throne of heaven, amen. Hallelujah! Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Would you be seated for just a moment? They're going to come in just, 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 just a second. And I, want to, I just want to talk to you literally because I, 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 can, I do not know how many people just responded to that time. And as there are going to be several people moving to begin to prepare for the ministry fair, but I want you to listen to me. If you prayed that prayer of faith, the Bible says that in the name of Jesus Christ, you have begun a journey called faith, and you have now been changed. The Bible says the Spirit of God is moving you from death unto life. That you are a new creature in Jesus Christ, and the devil's going to try to tell you it didn't happen. But you listen to this preacher today declare the Word of God. It has happened. He has changed you. And by faith you have confessed, and those that confess will be forgiven. And by faith you are born again. Welcome to the family of God today. Amen. When you stumble, when you're weary, don't forget what he's done for you. 
He's a good God. Amen. Listen, there are so many things coming up that are so super important, but there, there's, there's special times coming up with our Risen performance next week. The tickets will be ready next week for you to, to, get, to give those out to your friends, to invite them. It's going to be on Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. You don't want to miss the special walk-through Easter experience. You don't want to miss that. Also coming up on Easter weekend, Good Friday, we're going to be having 12 o'clock worship time and communion. Do your best to go ahead and take off work for that now. On Saturday night, we're going to have 6 o'clock, simply to make room with how much when our whole family comes together. On Easter, on Saturday night at 6 o'clock, will be the same service as 915 and 1045. We'd love for you to make plans to be a part of one of those times. I know there's a thousand different uh, announcements. I want you to hear these from me because I know God's going to use this time to change lives. Um, but right through those doors is where some of your journey is going to begin today. If you've been looking for the lightning bolt, it's not going to happen. But if you've been looking for the miracle, there's the key. Get involved in the things of God. My job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. You are called, chosen, highly favored of God. He loves you, and I am honored to get to pastor this wonderful congregation.